you've got dates of birth and social security numbers. And so if you're a hacker, sure, you'd love to get that. The Yucca Mountain will be safe for this type of storage for a million years. Is it at all weird to you that China has a show about rap before, say, the States does? I think, if anything, China needs a show like this. A French court has ordered the leader of the far-right party formerly known as the National Front to undergo a psychiatric exam. Marine Le Pen posted the court's request on Twitter, calling it sheer madness. She's under formal investigation for posting photos of Islamic State executions on Twitter in 2015. Le Pen says she doesn't plan to take the test. Arizona says it's planning to revoke the licenses of 13 shelters for migrant children operated by Southwest Key because the company failed to show that its employees passed background checks. A letter from the state criticized Southwest Key not only for missing its deadline to provide information, but for later supplying a mess of documents that officials said was incomprehensible. Southwest Key apologized, saying it's, quote, serious about ensuring that never happens again. Catholic bishops in the U.S. are taking the first steps to salvage a public image badly damaged by child sexual abuse allegations. The church's new policies include drafting a code of conduct for bishops, setting up a third-party-operated hotline for people to report misconduct confidentially, and developing policies to restrict the activities of bishops who've been accused. A shooting at a Rite Aid distribution center north of Baltimore that killed three people in the attacker means there's been a mass shooting in the U.S. every day this week. On Monday in Silver Spring, Maryland, on Tuesday in Tennessee and Louisiana, and on Wednesday in Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Washington may seem to be in suspended animation while waiting for the next development in the Brett Kavanaugh saga. But President Trump, at least, is pushing ahead. Trump stepped up his trade war with China this week, announcing 10% tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods. Those tariffs will rise to 25% on January 1st if China retaliates. And those are on top of the tariffs he's already put in place on things like steel, aluminum, and washing machines. Trump's tariffs have been criticized by big business, congressional Republicans, consumer groups, and most professional economists. But Trump insists his tariffs are part of a master plan for revitalizing American business. Unfortunately, neither he nor his administration can really explain how that's gonna happen. On Monday, Trump defended his tariffs and tried to explain them, kind of. China is now paying us billions of dollars and uh, we will see how that all works out. But a tariff is a tax on imports that's paid for by the company that's doing the importing, not by the country that makes the products. So if an American retailer buys $10 million in Chinese-made couches, it has to pay our government a million dollars. China pays us nothing. Even stranger was Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross's appearance on CNBC Tuesday. Because it's spread over thousands and thousands of products, nobody's gonna actually notice it at the end of the day. The clear implication here is that since tariffs are being imposed on so many products, any individual price hike would be so small that no one would care. This isn't actually true at all. The new tariffs are a flat 10% hike on the import price of products. So with more expensive products, like air conditioners or computers, they'll translate into substantial and quite noticeable price hikes. For example, Trump's tariffs on washing machines sent the price of those up 50 to 70 bucks. In fact, the whole point of Trump's tariffs is to make products made in China more expensive. That's supposed to make American products more competitive in terms of price and encourage companies to build stuff here rather than abroad. If tariffs don't raise prices noticeably, they can't work. I called up Austin Goolsby today to talk to him about Trump's tariff sales pitch. He was chief economist for President Obama, and he's not really a fan of Trump's trade protectionism, but he is in favor of pushing China around on trade. He said this White House is trying to hide the downsides of their efforts to do that. They know that if people see the prices of things publicly going up, they're going to be very upset. They recognize, oh, geez, we better not apply this to stuff that people actually buy. What I'm nervous about now is we are stumbling our way forward and potentially into a trade war without a very good strategy. Trump can't admit this, though, because he's pretending his tariffs will be painless for American consumers. 
Unlike his Chinese counterparts, Trump is vulnerable to things like political pressure and has to worry about stuff like public opinion and congressional support. So he's starting a trade war without being honest about how much it'll cost or how he plans to win it. What's your role? Just staff member state. All What's right. Your role? I am the elections director. You got big shoes to fill. Big <laughs> shoes to fill. <laughs> the people sitting in this cramped hotel conference room playing pretend are real Colorado election officials preparing for the actual upcoming election. The intent is for this to be uh, the Armageddon of Election Day. There's going to be a lot of things that'll happen. The things that are going to happen are problems. What did you do? The people in the yellow vests are the ones who announce them. Uh, we're doing a rare joint live broadcast. So this guy is playing a CNN reporter who's found a hack on Twitter. I'd like to speak to the county clerk of County 3 about her tweet saying libertarians should not be allowed to vote. Twitter yeah, my Twitter wouldn't have been hacked. I would have never used a password password. I'm really not interested in talking to the PIO. I'd really like to talk to the county clerk. Should... It's purposely chaotic. Do you want to talk to them about the tweet? Tell them we're, we're investigating it? No one is prohibited from voting. If you're registered to vote, you will vote. The table in the center is the election control hub, the Secretary of State's office. The four tables surrounding it are counties, and the four smaller tables on the outside are the voter service and polling centers. That's where people vote. Look up on the screen. Okay. Did that system have a vulnerability that our system has or does not have? I think, right. have they identified how they got through, and then does our, do we have that same vulnerability or do we not? Today, Matt Crane's playing the Colorado Secretary of State. In real life, he's the county clerk and chief election officer for Arapahoe County. Colorado's biggest. Had you dealt with any of the problems that you dealt with today before? Yes. You know, whether it was problems at vote centers with power outages, or somebody puts on social media that there's a long line at this location, or you're trying to disenfranchise, you know, a certain demographic. Even before this exercise, Colorado was considered one of the safest places in the nation to cast a ballot. The state keeps a paper trail of its votes and allows anyone who wants to to vote by mail, which alleviates some of the election day pressure on officials. But after Russia interfered in the 2016 elections, just about every state in the nation realized that the threat to the vote was bigger than just long lines, that foreign malicious actors could be trying to hack into their systems. Those attempts are made on a daily basis. Our system gets scanned. We've got dates of birth and social security numbers. And so if you're a hacker, sure, you'd love to get that. And it's our job to try to make sure that information is protected and secure. And you feel that you're there? I feel that we are there at this moment, but we need to continue to improve. We are constantly having to address issues that may not have existed a few years before. Some of the issues they deal with during the simulation are common, like concerns over racial discrimination at the polls. I'm sure you're aware that uh, long lines of voters are forming. Most of them appear to be, from, from our uh, investigation, uh, voters with Hispanic surnames who've always voted by mail in the past and claim that they have not received their mail ballot. If they did not receive it, good thing they have until 7 p.m. today to go to one of our voter service and polling centers. We have an interactive map that they're able to use to find the one that's closest to them, and they're able still to vote. Others are more complicated, like when the state's voter information database was leaked. You guys, you just got uh, yeah. noticed, Homeland Security reports to you that they got a report that the SCORE database has been posted on the dark web. Wow. That's a problem. I'm wondering if uh, it would be worthwhile to lie to the media and just tell them that the database no, is not. No, 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 no never, no never, lies. never lie. No. We have to verify that the data's actually been compromised. If it hasn't been, we're fine. Um, if it has been, um, then that's when we need to kick in with DHS. A lot of these issues, officials can't do anything to prevent. <laughs> Jay Tapper, CNN, this just in, Colorado election in chaos. The one thing they can try to do is control the message. 
Because whether people show up and vote has a lot to do with whether they have faith in the system. And that means the message is really what matters. What the Russians were really after is to shake, you know, our, our citizens' faith and our foundations and the ability to vote. So we've really taken that on to try to go and reestablish, you know, people's faith in the voting process. And we try to get rid of any blocks to access that we can so that, you know, people can get in and out and vote as quickly and easily as possible. The polls are now closed. Good job, On Sunday, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi is rolling out the world's largest government-funded healthcare program, which could help half a billion people. Its popular name? Modicare. Medical bills push more than 100 million Indians into poverty every year, which the new insurance plan is trying to prevent. Right now, Indians pay 64% of their medical costs out of pocket, six times the percentage Americans pay. So Modicare promises to insure the poorest 100 million families up to $7,500 a year. Though that may not sound like a lot, it's huge in a country where the average person annually earns just $1,820. The plan would also make it easier to get care by opening 150,000 wellness centers to offer free checkups and essential drugs. And for more specialized medicine, each of India's 29 states would get at least one government medical college. There's no question that this is ambitious, but there are lots of questions about how to pay for it. Officials estimate that the insurance alone, without counting the wellness centers, could cost the federal government $1.7 billion. But the country doesn't have a great track record at keeping government health care financially viable. Each year since Modi took office in 2014, existing plans paid out more than they took in. So $1.7 billion might not actually be enough to cover the new plan. And that's just the financial challenge. Right now, two-thirds of Indians live in rural areas where health centers are understaffed. A quarter of primary care jobs and almost two-thirds of positions for specialists like pediatricians, surgeons, physicians, and OBGYNs are empty. Filling those jobs is tricky because most of India's doctors prefer living in wealthier urban centers. The countryside just isn't developed enough to attract them. So Modi is faced with a chicken and egg problem. He's got to boost economic development to get his health care plan off the ground. But he can't boost economic development if he doesn't tackle health care costs first. Since the beginning of the atomic age, America has relied on nuclear power for a huge share of its energy. But every year, the sector generates more than 2,000 tons of radioactive waste. This week, the country's oldest nuclear plant in Lacey, New Jersey, closed after 49 years, and there's nowhere permanent to put the waste that's been stored there. Around the country, spent fuel is piled up in more than 80 locations, just waiting. The problem is that nuclear waste is dangerous for at least 10,000 years, long after most containers and facilities built to house it have fallen apart. Republican Congressman John Shimkus has radioactive waste all over his backyard. His home state, Illinois, has more of it than any other state. Ratepayers and states that generate electricity have been paying into a fund to solve this problem, and we haven't solved the problem, and we've taken their money. I think they'd be very angry. What's the problem with having these things here and just replacing them when they go past their usefulness? Well, you won't replace them. If they stay here, they'll stay here forever. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says these are safe, but it's only safe for about 40 or 50 years, versus what the law of the land says is find a permanent repository. If completed, uh, Yucca Mountain will be safe for this type of storage for a million years. Yucca Mountain, 100 miles from Las Vegas in the Nevada desert, was chosen by the Department of Energy in 1987 as the country's safe deposit for nuclear waste. But 30 years later, it's nowhere close to completion. This is the classic not-in-my-backyard syndrome. This issue has been in Congress for about 20 years now. We would hope that the repository in Nevada will be open by 2010. Under pressure from powerful former Nevada Senator Harry Reid, Obama cut off funding for the project in 2010. The change of administration reignited the debate. 
In May, Shimkus led the passage of a bill through the House that would restart the process of opening Yucca Mountain and took a delegation on a tour of the site. But not a single Nevada representative showed up. And over here on this side, see those big black cables right there? Yeah. Those are our power cords. Shimkus wanted his colleagues to support a $268 million budget allocation for the project and help him push the bill over to the Senate. At a photo op after the tour, they seemed convinced. When you come out and see something firsthand, you see something your colleagues haven't. It is our job to go back and educate. We have problems with storing nuclear sped fuel all over the country, and it's not safe where it is. It is time to move forward in America to resolve this problem. But funding for Yucca Mountain was cut from the Senate-approved September spending package. The reason? The senator from Nevada. Republican Dean Heller, another Nevada senator with serious skin in the game. As long as I'm in the Senate, Yucca Mountain is dead. It's simple as that. We're just protecting the short-term political interests of um, senators. Who says then the next senator from Nevada is going to put the pressure on the next majority leader of the Senate to say no? Heller could lose his seat in November, potentially turning the Senate blue. And that's a more immediate threat to the Republican Party than radioactive waste. They're trying to block the money to have the final scientific argument of whether it's safe or whether it's not. I'm willing to have that argument. The state of Nevada is not willing to have that argument. When it was Obama and Reid, I could do some righteous anger partisan-wise, right? Right. But now it's McConnell and Paul Ryan. I have to be consistent. Sure. Righteous anger against them for not complying with the law. Hip hop has been a global phenomenon for decades, but it's hard for a genre based on conferring authority to grow in a country where the government actively censors the media. So in China, hip hop's never really gone beyond an underground subculture. That all changed last year with a new TV show called The Rap of China, a reality TV show that's kind of like American Idol, but all rap and in Chinese. The show got 3 billion views on iQiyi, which is a little like Netflix in the Chinese market. Everyone from hardcore fans to complete rap newcomers were tuned in. But just months after the first season ended, things went south. One of the winners of the show was accused of having an affair with a married actress. (laughs) They both denied it. Then he was criticized for glorifying sex and drugs in his lyrics. He quickly apologized and blamed his vulgar lyrics on the influence of black music. But the damage was done. And in January, the Chinese government banned hip hop culture, period, from being shown on TV. But this year, the rap of China is somehow back on the air. They've expanded, and they even did auditions in Los Angeles. The show has a new title in Chinese, but everything else is the same, including the logos, most of the judges, and the format of the show. IGE seems to have been granted an exception to the government hip-hop ban, but it's not really clear how. <laughs> Chen Wei is the CEO of IGE and the head producer of The Rap of China. How are you able to make a rap show if rap's banned in China? Oh. <laughs> Zhongguo to build an entertainment empire on top of a genre that's technically banned, IGE is doing whatever they can to keep the government happy. So if a contestant has a tattoo, they make them cover it up on stage. And this season, all the lyrics seem to be really positive and patriotic. Most of the contestants grew up in China, so they're used to dealing with government restrictions. But even American rappers like Al Rocco, who moved to China hoping to jumpstart his career, are pretty careful about what they say in interviews. 
Do you find yourself having to tone yourself down a little bit? I wouldn't say tone myself down, more like, um, I guess, to adjust to the culture here compared to the West. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And the West is so free. You know what I mean? Here is kind of like, I guess, it's more controlled and in a good way, though. You know what I'm saying? How so? Like, kind of educate the people because honestly, hip hop in China is so young. People don't really understand what hip hop is. You know, for me, what hip hop is to better yourself, to understand yourself, and to keep it real. A lot of the underground rap scene in China thinks the stuff that appears on the show is way too sanitized. Some rappers have even refused to be on the show. But the rap of China isn't going for the underground. They're going for mainstream audiences. And if you want to get in front of those mainstream audiences, you have to play by the rules. Al Rocco ended up getting eliminated in one of the final rounds, mostly because he's not good at rapping in Chinese. The judge who made that decision is Chris Wu, one of the biggest pop stars in Asia. He's a Chinese Canadian who also moved to China for his career, so he knows how hard the Chinese market can be. This show is called Rapid China, so we're looking for rappers that can rap in Chinese, and for them, it's kind of is 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 really hard because Chinese is not their first language. I mean, so for they, Al Rocco. Yeah, for Al Rocco. It's legit just because of the Chinese barrier. Well, that him. honestly, that's that's a big factor. Is it at all weird to you that China has a show about rap before, say, the States does? I think. I think if anything, China needs a show like this. In the States, I feel like there's so many different platforms and even if you're just putting stuff on SoundCloud, you can blow, blow up, right? But out here is like, there's really no outlet for them besides this show. Have you seen injuries as bad as this before? Every day, every time we work, I've seen something like this. Definitely after the Olympic Games, we are getting more unsafe, more and more and more each year. When was the last time the government control here? <laughs> 